The Lord be with you. Right, thank you very much. Welcome to worship this morning. We're glad you're here. Um, we are at the point of changing of the seasons, so it's nice to have those windows open. I like that. Um, we've got one more Sunday of 9.30 worship. Two weeks from today is Rally Sunday, and we go back to our 8.30 and 10.30 schedule. We're going to have fun stuff going on outside on Rally Sunday two weeks from today. Um, this coming Wednesday is our final summer Wednesday worship, and uh, today is our, our uh, extra offering day. Um, the uh, the ushers are going to be at the back of the sanctuary following service with those wicker baskets if you'd like to contribute and give to campus ministries, Lutheran campus ministries. That's a, it's a great ministry for um, those young people, formational time away from home at college, and, um, and uh, a great way to support them. Let us begin our worship service as we always do then in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please rise as we sing. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God who forgives our sins, whose mercy endures forever. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart, we have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sin. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all.
In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Let us pray. O God, mighty and immortal, you know that as fragile creatures surrounded by great dangers, we cannot by ourselves stand upright. Give us strength of mind and body so that even when we suffer because of human sin, we may rise victorious through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Please be seated.
The Lord promises those who have returned from exile that there will, there, where justice and mercy prevail, the ruins will be rebuilt and light will rise in the darkness. It is the day for new beginnings. Our first reading is from Isaiah chapter 58, verses 9b through 14. If you remove the yoke from among you, the pointing of the finger, the speaking of evil, if you offer your food to the hungry and satisfy the needs of the afflicted, then your light shall rise in the darkness, and your gloom be like the noonday. The Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your needs in parched places, and make your bones strong, and you shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters never fail. Your ancient ruins shall be rebuilt. You shall raise up the foundations of many generations. You shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of the streets to live in. If you refrain from trampling the Sabbath, from pursuing your own interests on my holy day, if you call the Sabbath a delight and the holy day of the Lord honorable, if you honor it, not going your own ways, serving your own interests, or pursuing your own affairs, then you shall take delight in the Lord, and I will make you ride upon the heights of the earth. I will feed you with the heritage of your ancestor Jacob, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken." Using images of Moses from the Old Testament, the writer presents a striking vision of the new covenant of God made possible in Christ. There is no longer fear, only awe and the new promise in Christ into which we are invited. Our second reading is from Hebrews chapter 12, verses 18 through 29. You have not come to something that can be touched, a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and a tempest, and the sound of a trumpet and a voice whose words made the hearers beg that not another word be spoken to them. For they could not endure the order that was given. If even an animal touches the mountain, it shall be stoned to death. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to the innumerable angels in festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. See that you do not refuse the one who is speaking, for if they did not escape when they refused the one who has warned them on earth, how much less will we escape if we reject the one who warns from heaven? At that time his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised, yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heaven." This phrase, yet once more, indicates the removal of what is shaken, that is, created things, so that what cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us give thanks, by which we offer to the God an acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for indeed our God is consuming fire. The word of the Lord. Jesus, in our reading today, heals a woman on the Sabbath, offering her a new beginning for her life. When he's challenged by the synagogue leader who held a particularly narrow reading of that Sabbath commandment, Jesus replies that the Sabbath was meant to be a liberation from all forms of bondage. The Holy Gospel according to Luke, the 13th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Now Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath and just then there appeared a woman with a spirit that had crippled her for 18 years. She was bent over and she was quite unable to stand straight. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said, Woman, you are set free from your ailment. When he laid his hands on her, immediately she stood up straight and began praising God. But the leader of the synagogue... <clears throat> indignant because Jesus had cured somebody on the Sabbath, kept saying to the crowd, there are six days on which work ought to be done. Come on those days and be cured, not on the Sabbath day. And the Lord answered him, you hypocrites. 
Does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the manger and then lead him away to give it water? So ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has bound for 18 long years, be set free from this bondage on the Sabbath day? And when he said this, all his opponents were put to shame, and the entire crowd was rejoicing at the wonderful things that he was doing. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. Let us pray. O Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. You can't do that on the Sabbath, says the unenlightened synagogue leader. Now, I saw a meme on Facebook last week which informed me that there are, in fact, two days where nothing can be done. One is yesterday and the other is tomorrow. So today is the right day to love, believe, be free, live. Nobody told that synagogue leader, though. And to be honest with you, I kind of feel bad for the guy. Being essentially the modern-day Christian equivalent of a synagogue leader myself, I confess to you all with no small amount of sheepishness that this encounter from our gospel today is just the kind of perfect storm, uh, you can't see the forest through the trees scenario that keeps me up at night. The commandment says, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy, which means that it's a no work day or a focus on family day. And it's been established that no healings take place on this day and certainly not on synagogue property. I suppose that is probably a pretty good rule if the only healers that you've ever met before are sneaky charlatans, snake oil salesmen. But all that changed on this day for that group uh, gathered there at the synagogue. Because today they met a real healer. The real healer. The only real healer. And that synagogue leader, bless his heart, had a decision to make. Does he do what he's paid to do, what he's done countless times before, and make the safe assumption that this healer is most likely not the Son of God? Or does he risk everything he knows, everything he's ever worked for, and admit to himself that this healer is something different? The problem I have is that I am almost certain that I have been that miserable, mistaken synagogue leader. How many times? I don't even want to imagine. This is the kind of thing that happens in churches, in street corners, in schools, and offices all over the world every week, every day. Users and fakers show up right alongside Jesus and they're all dressed exactly the same. So who's who? This is the dilemma. Do I risk dishonoring myself in this place by, by trusting that God is at work for the sake of liberation among the person who knocks on my door with an unbelievable request of the people of God or an unbelievable offer to the people of God? I used to have anxiety dreams about showing up for the first day of school with no clothes on, but those anxiety dreams have been almost completely replaced with slightly different versions of this gospel story. If someone showed up and claimed to have healed one of you who've been entrusted to my spiritual care, would I welcome that person or would I chase them away? Do I turn away the scores of users knowing I might be turning away Lord Jesus, or do I just treat everyone who calls as if they might uh, be Lord Jesus? If I welcome that person, would I be welcoming into this house a swindler or the Son of God? My hands are getting sweaty thinking about it, because the stakes are real, <clears throat> and they are high. The truth is that this life of discipleship ain't for the faint of heart. I've heard it said that 
Courage is, courage is knowing that a thing might hurt and doing it anyway. And that stupidity is knowing that a thing might hurt and doing it anyway. And that's what makes life hard. Because for the most part, you're just not going to know until it's over. So what does the synagogue leader do? What does he choose? He chooses to do the safe thing. He falls back on what he's been taught. What does the law say? The law says, honor the Sabbath. Which is to say, he tells Jesus, if you are really so good, you should know that there are six other days each and every week with which to do your supposedly miraculous works, and yet you choose the one day on which such things are prohibited? If you are of God, why do you break the law? And that is the wrong answer. Jesus puts the question back on him the same way that he puts the question back to us. Jesus says, Jesus says, what is the purpose of the law? What is the purpose of the law? According to the stories told in the Old Testament, says Pastor David Lois, the purpose of the law is to provide us guidance in how to live with each other so that all of us might get more out of this life and this world that we share. It's meant to help us provide order and peace. Those are good things, but they're not going to save you. It's meant to provide order and peace. But that is not how we always use the law. Now, precisely because law does, in fact, give us a modicum of order to a chaotic world, we are all too often seduced into thinking that maintaining that order is the purpose of the law. You see how that synagogue leader gets caught that day? He thinks that maintaining order is the purpose of the law. The original commandment to keep the Sabbath holy and to do no work on the Sabbath was meant to ensure that the Israelites, right, they had just been saved from bondage in Egypt and they are following Moses through the desert and those who've been in bondage for generations, now that they're free, they don't know what to do. And that law was meant to ensure that the Israelites who'd been slaves for generations and never knew that rest could finally be guaranteed to ensure that they got at least one day of rest each week. The law of the Sabbath, then, in other words, was designed to promote life and health, and that clueless synagogue leader chastises Jesus for bringing life and health to this woman because it disrupts the order, which that man prizes above all else. The law was a gift, yes, but long before the law was given to us, we were given to each other. You see how important that is? What was given first? The law was not given to us first. First, we were given to each other. Our greatest blessing, then, is not the law. Our greatest blessing is each other. And the most profound way to honor the life that God gave you is to throw honor the life that God gave me. Right? The most profound way to honor the life that God gave me is to honor the life that God gave you. Honoring the power of God's blessing sets us free because that is how we honor Christ's presence in our midst. It was not the responsibility of the synagogue leader to free that woman from her ailments that day. That wasn't his work to do. That was God's work to do. The leader's responsibility was to honor her place in the community by welcoming her the way that God welcomed him, and that is what he could not see. Jesus, above all, sets people free from bondage. And I hope that the synagogue leader was able to figure that out someday. I hope there was hope for him yet, because this is the heart of God in Jesus. That Jesus willingly postpones what he's doing to turn to those in need. That Jesus straightens those who are bent in body or mind or spirit. That Jesus touches the untouchable. That Jesus prioritizes the blessedness of people, not things. Now, Sabbath is rest for the weary, and rest for the weary is exactly what Jesus gives. The same that day as it is this day. Sabbath is a way of living that proclaims your dependence upon the one who blesses you and calls you to trust in the goodness of life that you were given to live so that we may trust 
in the goodness of life that I or he or she or they are given to live. Sabbath is a reckoning that this gift has been given to you in the exact same measure that it's been given to all others. And to limit anybody else's access to Sabbath, sanctuary, or synagogue is to limit also your own access, my own access to the gift. In the same way, all that we do to widen the scope and access of that gift for others only deepens the richness for that gift in our own lives as well. It's the way grace works. The more you use it, the more you have. Each and every day we are given an invitation to start our Sabbath life anew. In this freedom, we let go of yesterday's sufferings, and surrender not just those sufferings, but our whole selves to God, whose commandment is steadfast with the grace that we need to rise and live. We will all have made right choices and wrong. We will all sometimes be victorious in our trials and sometimes waylaid. Our faces, each and every one of us, will be covered with the same dust, the same scrapes and bruises on our hands and knees bearing witness to the same struggles. We will win some and we will lose, and after all, God remains. God remains at our side and on our side. Grace remains. Sabbath and rest for the weary remains. And in our new beginnings, our daily renewal, God calls us, empowers us to trust again in his Sabbath way. In our Sabbath life, grace itself lays its hands on us and frees us to rise again, believe again, hope again, Praise again. Precisely because yesterday's unmet expectations and tomorrow's fears belong to God, grace for today belongs to us. Amen.
Please rise as you're able. Gathered here and now as God's people in Christ Jesus, we confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Lord, treasuring your promise to hear us when we call, we pray now for the church, for those in need, and for all of your creation. Lord of mercy, we cry out to you in our distress, trusting in your compassion for your whole creation. Raise up the baptized to offer Christ's healing and forgiveness to all who are in distress. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We rejoice, Lord, in your creation, water that nourishes land and creatures, gardens and fields with a diversity of plants and animals. Bless those who show new ways of understanding this complex beauty around us. Lord, Lord of the harvest, we ask your blessing upon this time. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We seek the kingdom that cannot be shaken. Come to the rescue of those who are displaced by war or famine or other disasters. Bless diplomats, peacemakers, peacekeepers, rescue workers, and all who are given aid through their efforts. Lord, we ask your blessing upon Governor Burgum, Governor Walls, President Trump, that peace and plenty prevail. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You provide deliverance and justice for all who are oppressed. Free those who are in bondage to substances or gambling or other forms of addiction. Release victims of human trafficking and grant them safety. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We, you know our needs in this community. Heal the hurts of all who are bent with sickness or aging or suffering. All of those who are named in our bulletins, named on our lips, and those who have no one to name them. Accompany them with our work. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You raise up witnesses in every generation. As we remember those who've passed into your peace before us, comfort us in the hope of your son's resurrection. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. All these things, Lord, and more we ask in the name of Jesus Christ. By the power of your Holy Spirit, amen. You may be seated.
for the gifts we've received and the gifts we are about to receive. Blessed are you, O God, maker of all things. Through your goodness, you've blessed us with these gifts, ourselves, our time, and our possessions. Use us in what we have gathered in feeding the world with your love through the one who gave himself for us, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. We gather at Christ's word. We gather at Christ's table. On the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord took bread and broke it. He gave thanks and gave it for all to eat, saying, Take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again after supper he took the cup, blessed it, gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. The congregation, please rise as you're able. Lord, remember us in your kingdom. Teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. All who believe Christ is present at this meal are welcome and invited to the table. You may now have a seat and come forward shortly at your usher's direction.
Let us pray. We give you thanks, Almighty God, that you've refreshed us through the healing power of this gift of life. In your mercy, strengthen us through this gift, in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Please rise now, receive the blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen.